in the last video, we ended up with this example. And there were actually four of them that we did. And I told you at this point, this is how easy substitutions need to work. And quite honestly, at the heart, it is this easy. You find a leaving group, that leaving group goes away. That's why we call it the leaving group. And then something else goes on in its spot. However, there are details, and those details we need to pay attention to. And the details are going to fall in either the SN2 or the SN1 category. They're all substitutions. At the heart, again, something is going to leave and something will take its place. But depending on whether it's SN2 or SN1, folks, this could lead us to a slightly different product than what we would expect. All right, so in order to do this, I've told you a few times at this point that we're going to have to be able to get comfortable picking out whether an SN2 or an SN1 happens. And the very first thing that we're going to talk about in, in helping us to determine this is steric hindrance. Okay, steric hindrance. What does this mean? Well, here's the rule for steric hindrance. Primary alkyl halides are going to be the most reactive in SN2 reactions than the tertiary alkyl halides. So here's the first rule that we have to talk about. Remember I told you size matters. Okay, well, here's our example. Size matters. Tertiary halides are actually so slow that we just say they will not react. There's no reaction as far as SN2 is concerned. So remember, carbon seeing both people at the same time. Carbon's the cheater. Primary alkyl halides allow it to happen all the time. The tertiary halides, not so much. It actually slows down the process so much that we just say that SN2 is not going to happen here. Carbon will not be a cheater. So the mechanism is going to be different when substitution actually happens. All right, so here's my layman terms. This is what this means. Imagine you live on a street, and here's your house right there, and it's you and your significant other, and you wake up one morning, and you kiss each other goodbye, and honey walks out the door and gets into the car and drives off. Okay, well, if an SN2 reaction is going to happen here, that means carbon's the cheater. So, there's got to be another one that has to come through the back door and not be caught and not be seen. Well, let's say that you live on a street and there's no other houses up and down the street. Nobody's going to see it happen. This is a very easy process to take place. No one is going to see the sneaker that's coming behind the house through the back door while your significant other leaves out the front door to go to work, thinking that you're behaving yourself and cleaning the house while they're gone. Well, very easy process. SN2 happens very easy here. Carbon can cheat as much as carbon wants. Now, let's take a same street, and let's say that you have the house on that street, but yet, over here next door, we have another house. Well, as you can imagine, if you're trying to keep this a secret, folks, well, you got to worry a little bit now, and the reason is because you've got a peeper next door, and they're always looking out. And they're watching what goes on up and down the street. This cheating scenario is going to happen a little bit more riskier, right? The reason is because something else is there. Something else is going to slow down the cheating. Maybe sometimes the little peeper is outside 
on their front porch and they're watching these people run up and down the yard and wondering what is going on at that house over there. I'm calling the police. 911. I got a report to claim. Well, SN2 slows down quite a bit. Now imagine you on a street and here's your house and there's the peeper house next door that always has a watchful eye, neighborhood watch, yeah, give me a break. But yet, you've got also a neighbor that's right here as well, right beside of you. So the same kind of scenario is going to exist. One person leaves, goes to work. How is the other one going to sneak around in the neighborhood to try to come through the back door? It's very hard. Because there's more houses. There's more houses. There's more people. There's more people. They see what goes on. And then sooner or later, they're going to be up to your trick. Sooner or later, they're going to know what is going on in your house while your significant other is at work. Or maybe it's you leaving to work and leaving your significant other behind. Who knows? Folks, this it really relates to a primary and a secondary and a tertiary carbocation, or alkyl halide in this case. What do I mean by that? Steric hindrance. That's what we're learning about now in regards to substitution. So if I have a compound, let's do four carbons like this all the way across, and let's say that this halogen is on the very end. Or let's say I have four carbons like this, and the bromine is going to be here on the second carbon in. Or what if we've got three carbons like this with the bromo, but that fourth carbon is going to be there? All three of these play a different role when it concerns substitution. We've already said primary reacts the best and tertiary reacts the worst, actually so much that we say substitution's not going to happen as far as SN2 goes. And that's the kicker. SN2 is what we're talking about. Carbon is the cheater. And this is why. We have a cheat group. Hydroxide, NH2 for amine, anything below that chart, below bromine. Anything below bromine is prettier. So we have this cheat group that needs to sneak. And this sneaky group needs to kind of weasel its way in to that carbon in order for the cheating to take part and take place. So this OH group has a very easy time kind of sneaking into that carbon because, folks, there's no houses around it. This is a primary alkyl halide. And it's very easily accessible. That back door is always unlocked. That OH group can go into that back door anytime they please. And no one is there to see them. However, in the second scenario, this is a secondary alkyl halide. This is stuff that we learned back in the day in Lecture Module 3 when we started learning about halogens and alkanes, right? This bromo group is on a carbon. That carbon's on two others. So therefore, this is secondary. Well, this OH group is going to try to sneak in, and it's going to go, oh, yeah, well, you know what? I can't really go that way. Er, we're going to turn around, and then we're going to kind of come back on the back door side, but I got to watch it because, you know, this carbon, he's got some buddies around him. There's some houses around him, and they might see me if I'm not careful, so I'm going to have to have a little bit harder time going in on the back side without being seen. So that process takes a little bit longer, which is why the reaction is not as fast. Now let's take a look at the tertiary version that's down here at the bottom. This tertiary bromo is attached to a carbon, and that carbon has three other carbons on it. So we have a tertiary alkyl halide, and we have this OH group that's going to come in, and it's going to go, oh, no, oh, we're going to turn around. Bromine's coming out the front door. i got to be able to get sneaky. 
So the OH comes around this way, and it goes, uh-oh. Look, there's two buddies on this street. They're out on the front porch, and I can't really go in that direction. Maybe I'll kind of come around. Oh, no, because there's two other people on this street, too. It's kind of preventing me from sneaking into the back door. You see this horde of carbons that are surrounding that tertiary carbon. And it makes it very difficult for that OH group to get in there and to actually attach. So the OH group just kind of floats around a little bit and it tries to find a really good spot in order to get to and it really can't ever find a good spot without getting caught. So OH group just kind of turns around and it goes away. And that's why we say the reactions are so slow, so slow, that we just say they don't even happen. So carbon is not a cheater with tertiary alkyl halides. And it's due to the fact that there's so many buddies around carbon, it's going to make it, that nucleophile, very difficult to get in and to do the job. So SN2s. Primaries are okay. Secondaries are okay. But tertiaries, eh, not so much. They cannot undergo SN2 reactions. Bulky molecules are very bad for a cheater carbon. And this is the way that you have to remember it. Think of the street, think of the houses, think of the neighbors. If you're going to cheat, would you rather cheat being on a house up a street where no one sees who comes and goes? Or would you rather be in a neighborhood where all the houses are piled on top of each other and all the neighbors know each other and everything that goes in on your front yard and your backyard both? I think you know the answer to that if you're going to be a cheater. I hope you're not a cheater. But if you are, keep in mind, bulky groups, bulky streets, bulky houses make it a problem. Don't get caught. And that's one of the ways that you can get caught. So let's take a look at another example. Before we go through and start talking about more reactions, we've already seen a couple of examples of intro reactions, right? But nothing nitty gritty yet. So let's take a look at an example problem like this. Arrange the following alkyl bromides in order of decreasing largest to smallest reactivity in an SN2 reaction. So the largest activity in SN2. That means what's the easiest. And then the smallest reactivity, what is going to be the hardest group in order to have an SN2 reaction to take place. So before we do this, we have to draw out these molecules. So the first one was 1-bromo-2-methyl-butane. Again, see why I said it was cumulative? They're giving me a name. They want me to draw a structure of it. Folks, this is a review of Alkane Lecture, Module 3. So butane, 1, 2, 3, and 4. One bromo, so uh, one carbon, I have a bromo group, and the two carbon, I have a methyl group. So there's that structure. And then they tell me one bromo, again, and this time three methyl butane. All right, so butane's four carbon, one, two, three, four. Three, I have a methyl group, one, two, three, I have a methyl group. And then on carbon number one, I have this bromo group again. So there's that one. The other one that they want is two bromo, two methyl, butane. Again, they're keeping a trend here. That's good. It allows us to compare them a little bit easier. So four carbons, two methyl, so there's my second carbon, and two bromo. So off of this carbon, there's a bromine as well. And then finally, the last choice is one bromo pentane. Again, they're keeping the same number of carbons. This time, it's just not branched. One, two, three, four, five. And then on carbon one, I have a bromo group. So they want me to rank these. Which one would be the easiest to react in an SN2? 
and which one would be the hardest to react in an SN2. So I'm going to write down a little note down at the bottom, SN2s. Primaries react faster than secondaries, which react faster than tertiaries. Again, it's all about the neighbors. It's all about the seers or the peepers that are around you. Too many of them, this cheating action is not going to happen. So if I look at this bromo group, this carbon is attached to one other. So this is a primary. Down here below, this bromo group is attached to a carbon that's attached to one other. So that's also a primary. This one, 2-bromo-2-methylbutane over on the right. This bromo group's attached to a carbon that's attached to three others. So this is a tertiary. And this 1-bromo-pentane, folks, this bromo is attached to a carbon that's also attached to one other. So this is a primary as well. Uh-oh. Well, how are we supposed to rank these? I mean, you just told me primary is greater than secondary, which is greater than tertiary. Well, we have a tertiary. I know that's going to be last. That's going to be the hardest. So this is going to be number four. That's the hardest one to react with. It's the slowest one for a cheater carbon. So this is not going to behave very well in an SN2 reaction. So these other three options, we have primaries all the way around. So how on earth are we supposed to rank these? Folks, think about the geometry. That's part of organic. It's part of what we've always been talking about all semester. Think about the street. Think about the neighbors. How close are neighbors to you? Well, if you look at the bromo group, this is the carbon that's going to be the questionable cheater one, right? And right next door, we have a carbon that also has another carbon right beside of it. Well, take a look at this one. This bromo group is attached to this particular carbon. Right next door is a carbon. And then next to it is a carbon with a carbon attached. Think about bulkiness. Think about how many houses that are around that possible cheater carbon. And then down here at below, one bromopentane. This is the questionable carbon. That is the possible cheater but look at that molecule. It's a straight chain molecule all the way down. So on the street, there's not anyone in the backyards. There's not anyone in the side yards. It's just one long narrow street with a house here and a house there and a house here. That's all there is. So this is going to be the easiest. This molecule down here below, one bromopentane, is going to be rank number one. Why? Folks, that carbon has only one other carbon around it, and that's it. Nobody's going to hopefully see anything when he cheats, or she cheats. Over here to the left-hand side, we now need to rank these the same way. Now, this is a branched molecule. The one on top and the one on bottom are both branched. However, this branching is a little bit closer to the cheater carbon than this branching is. Again, it's all about geometry here. So what that means is that if the carbon's going to cheat, this one is going to happen a little bit easier. And the reason is because that branched group is further away from the carbon that we have a question mark beside of. And because that branching is further away, there is more available space for that incoming nucleophile to sneak and get into the back door. And then the one up here at the top, that's a primary. But it's got a neighbor kind of close, compared to the other one at least. So if a group is going to come in and try to go and sneak through the back door to get to that carbon, folks, this one's going to have a little trickier time because we have a group that's a little bit closer to that carbon that's there that's going to see what happens. So this is going to be number three. Number four, forget it. You know, that's like an apartment community where everybody is up in everybody's business. That's what number four is all about. That group, if it tries to come in and tries to go and cheat with that carbon, there is no room for it anywhere. There's nowhere that it can squeeze in in order to cheat and in order for carbon to make up its mind on what he wants to do. Too many things around it. 
And that is how we make this decision and this determination of which one, smallest to largest or largest to smallest, depending on what they ask for, and ranking them in terms of SN2 reactions. All right. So that's where this video is going to stop. I think that we've made our point with steric hindrance. I think that we've made our point now with neighbors and nosy neighbors and figuring out what's going on and how carbon can cheat and how carbon cannot cheat. And this is just one more step, one more thing that we can add into our toolbox in order to figure out if a reaction is going to happen in an SN2 route or an SN1 route where carbon doesn't cheat. So what are some of the other things that we can bring to the table? I'm going to talk about those in the next video.